All right, hello everybody. This is James Stanley with Daily Effects. Just wanted to do a quick sound check. So if you can hear my voice, please type in a Y. Please type in a Y if my voice is coming through. And as soon as we get confirmation on the audiovisual side, we'll get this session started. All right, perfect. Hello, Greta. Hope all is well today. Uh, Hans, Dion, Neil, Kimberly, Monir. All right, too many to list, but I just want to say thank you very much to everybody for your time in advance. Uh, we're at a pretty interesting juncture in my opinion. Uh, we're in the middle of some Fed speak, as in like right now, we have three different Fed speakers giving commentary to markets. Now what that commentary might say, how that might allude to future rate hikes, it's difficult to tell, but that's somewhat indicative of the environment that we're in right now. We're kind of pulling at straws trying to find that next driver and it really feels as though price action is setting up in a few different ways and a few different key markets that could be interesting for the next couple of weeks. Uh, and of course we get Article 50 finally getting triggered tomorrow. Uh, so we have a lot to talk about today, a lot of different setups to take a look at. Now this session is all about you, so if you have any setups in particular you want to look at, go ahead and fire those in the chat box. I'll do my absolute best to cover those when we get to the Q&A portion of the webinar. But uh, I'm going to go through a couple of quick risk disclaimers. I'm going to leave each up for about 15 seconds, then we'll get right onto the charts and we'll start making some uh, sense of this current madness. Risk disclaimer part one, trading is risky. If you're not familiar with this, please do familiarize yourself with it. I'm going to give this about another 10 seconds. All right, time for risk disclaimer part two, the hypothetical trading disclaimer. Anytime we look at past trades, anytime we look at strategy, we have to know past performance is not indicative of future results. I'm going to give this another 10 seconds. And there we go. All right, so that's the euro dollar. You can see here on this hourly chart, real interesting trend formation, kind of unfolding like an accordion, right? Two steps forward, one step back, two forward, and about a half step back there, another step forward. It's been putting in this formulaic type of uptrend, right? Uh, what's also really interesting here is that we did just set a new 2017 high, albeit barely. Notice that we had this swing right back here in December. So that's an interesting point of swing resistance. This was the prior 2017 high. We burst through that yesterday, caught some resistance at the second swing from back in uh, back in, in November, uh, excuse me, December. But you could get a pretty good idea of what I'm looking for right there. But let's start off with the dollar, and then we're going to extrapolate uh, out throughout a few of these currency pairs. Now, this is what I wanted to start off with because I think that this is going to help set up a lot of different major pairs that you might be looking at right now, which is we had this recent burst of weakness after the healthcare bill failed this week or this weekend, right? So when markets opened yesterday, we gapped lower here on the dollar. We ran right down to a point of support. It's the 618 retracement of the Trump bump. Okay, that came in right around 98, 92. Now if we go down a little bit tighter, you'll see we're just now we started to climb above this week's open price right there. All right, let's dial in a little, little, little tighter. Let's go on the hourly. There we go. Okay, so we closed here on Friday. We opened here on Sunday, Monday, and we've just now climbed back above that. Now, the reason I wanted to highlight this is because there is still some unfilled gap. Okay. Now, unfilled gaps can be really interesting to FX traders because FX markets in general don't close. They're 24 hours a day, but they do close on the weekends, by and large. Now, when we get those gaps, there's a tendency for price action to want to fill that gap. Now, it's totally possible that a gap goes unfilled, but in my mind, that would be the exception more than the rule. So I am still looking for some additional dollar strength to fill that gap, and the big question then is what happens once we get back to 99.85? Because this is a really big level on the dollar. Let's go to the four-hour chart. There we go. It's a really big level on the dollar. Is this the 50% retracement of that Trump move? It's given a couple of different iterations of support in the very recent past. And if we do wedge back there, I want to see if sellers come in to create resistance. Okay? If sellers come in to respond at 99.85, then the prospect of dollar weakness continuation is going to look a lot more attractive to me. But if sellers aren't able to hold it here, and if we are able to break back above this evening star formation right in here, 
Notice the eye of that evening star is right at 100. If we're able to break above those two, then I'm going to start getting my dollar bull hat back on. Now, I have a variety of setups today on both sides of this thing. And given the recent bout of weakness, this has really set up a lot of these major currency pairs in a very interesting spot. But this is something we're definitely going to want to take into account if we're lining up something like cable ahead of a, the Article 50 tomorrow. So speaking of which, let's just cut right to the chase, British pound. So if you're just watching short-term charts, at least up until <laughs> about an hour ago, you would have swore that this is a burgeoning uptrend, right? It has that same kind of accordion-like price action I was talking about a moment ago. A higher high, higher low, higher high, higher low, higher high, higher low. And when I get a setup like that, it's, it's just awesome because it makes my risk management a bit easier, right? Notice how each of these wicks has a, a general tendency to respect the prior low. Well, think about the price action that's going on at the time. If you do have a burgeoning uptrend and you see a retracement in that uptrend, it's the anticipation of buyers that's going to determine where this point of support comes in, right? If buyers are really, really excited, they're probably going to jump in to outnumber sellers a bit earlier, right? Or if buyers are a little bit more passive, a little bit more cautious, they might actually let sellers drive down into that prior swing high maybe even a little bit deeper below that swing high before it's then ready to kickstart and continue higher. We didn't have that, right? We had respect of those prior swing lows as it put in a very formulaic type of uptrend. Now, we set a new short-term high right here, 26.16, but this is where you're going to want to scroll it on the chart to look at the bigger picture setup because in reality, all we have is the fill of a range, right? That really strong uptrend right here it actually looks very similar to the uptrend that we saw in the British pound back in January. This is when Theresa May made her Brexit speech. This was the UK Supreme Court ruling. Just a couple weeks later, we set this high, and then we came right back down. So I want to pause the excitement on the bullish cable theme, at least with any type of intermediate term aspirations, until I do see resistance from this zone finally get broken. Until that happens, I'm under the impression that we are in a continued range. Right now, my bias would be to the upside to play into resistance. But as far as setting this up for a pure Brexit trade, I, I would pump the brakes on that. Because it seems as though there's a lot of folks that are almost accepting as a foregone conclusion that once Article 50 is triggered tomorrow, the British pound is going to scream higher. Maybe it does. I don't necessarily understand the logic behind something like that, so I'm going to be a little bit more trepidatious. But what is a little bit more exciting on the bullish side of this thing is if we can come down to one of these prior swing points, I might be able to get in for a relatively tight stop as we go into tomorrow's um, events, if you will, uh, to look for that continuation up to resistance so that if we do get the top side break, then I could look for that to continue running higher. So. I like the idea of dollar weakness here. Not a big fan on trying to hit it right now. Now, what's happened in the last hour, what's creating this wick or this dip right here was some BOE commentary from Mr. McCafferty, Ian McCafferty, who had essentially alluded that, yes, sure, inflation is running a little higher than we wanted, but there's not necessarily a reason for me to vote for a rate hike anytime soon. And I think that's somewhat of the underpinning of this recent bullish theme in the cable which is inflation is coming in higher than the BOE wanted, higher than the BOE expects, and they may have their hand pushed away from those dovish policy options before too long, to the point where they may even need to vote for a rate hike. Mr. McCafferty's commentary this morning has helped provide a bit of a dip into that trend. Now we're running down to a prior little area of support right here, about 24, uh, 75, right around 24 and three quarters. The bigger zone of interest for me is right down here, about 24, 15 to 24 and a quarter. What I want to watch here is I want to see if we do in fact get maybe a little bit of tightening up ahead of Article 50, uh, or maybe even a continuation of this real very recent bout of USD strength, whatever might, might create it. If I could get some element of support here at about 24.18, this becomes a bit more attractive on the bullish continuation trade from a couple of different perspectives. Uh, one, I have this as a prior point of resistance, prior point of support. This is a level that's gotten a lot of price action in the past couple of months. Uh, 
Uh, but more to the point, it makes it easier for me to factor a stop if I could begin to look at profit targets up here around 26 and three quarters, as opposed to trying to get out at about 26.15 or, or thereabout. Uh, so I let, love the idea of a deeper retracement in here, 24.18. I wouldn't abandon bullish aspirations until we get down to about 23.50 and then 23.20. If we break back down below 23.20, uh, that, that, that bullish setup is, is no longer attractive. And that's the point at which I want to abandon the ship. Uh, so that's what I'm looking to do in cable right now. Uh, Euro, a little bit cleaner as we looked at a moment ago. There is still some unfilled gap in here as well. Okay, notice that we had the weekend gap right here, the close and then the open, right? We haven't yet filled that gap. We just barely started to tiptoe below the weekly open. And notice some buyers came in right in there. Uh, but you see the potential support zone that I want to look at for bullish euro setups. Uh, the reason this is attractive to me is because we hadn't yet seen a support test at 108.20, which is a very key level. This is the 50% retracement of what I'm calling the most recent major move. And that's taken the uh, election night spike down to the uh, January low. And there was a lot of bearish stuff that happened to euro dollar during that period, right? We had ECB extend to, or add a new QE program here. We had the Fed rate hike right there, December 15th, right? Very near the lows. But after those two events happen, look at what takes place. We get price action probing down here to develop a low. We get a quick higher high above that spike right there, and then it begins moving in a little bit more of a bullish fashion. Right now, this 50% fib retracement, it's a real interesting level because we had caught a spike wick back in February right off of that high. And then we came in and we resisted right in here in that third week of March. We gapped through that level this weekend and we haven't yet tested this as support. So if I can get support down here, and I know that we're just 17 pips off, but the devil's in the details on, on, this, on these things, I'm not going to push it. Because more than just seeing that price, I want to see how buyers actually respond, right? If they don't respond at all, then me using the support level is probably not a good idea. But if we do get maybe even a little bit of penetration followed by a buyer response, followed by some continued bullishness, now that's going to look a little bit more attractive. The deeper the price runs, the more attractive this is going to look for support. At some point, it's not going to be worth me striking on it anymore because the price is going to be so far away from support that I'm no longer going to be able to get a 1-1 one -one risk reward. But if I can get some evidence that buyers are responding to that level, then I like the idea of some continued upside. All right, now both of those are essentially dollar weakness scenarios, dollar weakness setups. And you know, as I shared, my bias right now is on the side of dollar strength. There's an area that I've been watching for a while. This one is getting really gnarly, uh, as you can see by this descending channel here. But I think we're at a pretty interesting level where we can find out a lot of information about what might be the next move in here in dollar yen. So this is the Trump move right in here. Now, if you remember when we were looking at the dollar, we're basically bouncing right now off the 61.8% retracement of that Trump move, right? Well, dollar yen is at a bit more of a shallow retracement as we were previously supported on the 38.2 retracement of the Trump move. And now the next big level of interest is right here, the 50% retracement of that Trump move. Now, if we break below that zone around 110, uh, particularly with a sustained break, a daily close below, this is going to be not nearly as attractive for bullish continuation. At that point, we can make the statement that the Trump trade has been invalidated by a close below the 50% Fibonacci retracement. But until that happens, there's the prospect of a reversal. Uh, now, there's another attractive point with a level like this. Now, I, I consider this what I call a decision level. Okay, because if I do get that sustained break below, then that is a decision for me that I'm no longer going to be pressing the bullish theme here in dollar yen unless some other information fills in down the road. But it makes life a little bit more simple from the perspective of the fact that I know where I want to put my stop. I want to nest it below this zone somewhere. I don't want to put it at a real obvious level. I don't want to put it at a level like we have right here. You see that where I have a swing low that meshes with a prior swing high just like 18, 19 pips inside of that level. If I'm going to use this for a stop, I want to 
get it a little bit below. I want to hide it below that wick. Robbie Hill says, sure does look like a nice flag to the upside on dollar in. Yeah, that's basically what we're playing with here. It's a, it's a bull flag setup, right? We had a beautiful takeoff here on the Trump trade. Since early January, we've seen a lot of retracement, a lot of questions around that Trump trade. Um, but I think the big question as far as continued yen weakness is going to be revolving around whether or not the BOJ is ready to ready to tighten up a little bit. And all signs are pointing to the fact that they're not. That they're ready to keep the pedal to the floor on the QE front. And I'm going to operate under that assumption until something there changes. But yeah, in essence, we're just looking at a nice little bear, uh, bull flag formation. Now, once we get down and focus in on price action right down here, this is where things start to get a bit more interesting. Uh, now, if you looked at Market Talk this morning, I had talked about that in quite a bit of detail as far as how I was looking to hit that setup. That is available right here. Now, this will be kind of cool because we've had uh, a bit more information coming to the fold here. But basically, what I was looking for this morning was a test of that prior low to see if buyers were actually going to respond. And I walked through the whole logic and methodology as to why I was looking for what I was looking for here. But you could see here at the time, price action was burning down. It looked like we were going to get a test at 110.07. Uh, since then, we have seen some element of bulls return, right? There's that test. Notice that we did get, in fact, the higher low. What this says to me is that there's some buyer anticipation out there, right? Bulls weren't about to wait for a retest of 110.07. So they jumped in a bit quicker. They were able to take out or at least overpower the selling pressure that was seen at the time. And now we're right back up, wiggling up to prior resistance on 110.73. It's a lot less attractive than it was this morning when I was writing about it because we're 50 pips off those lows. That means it's going to be 50 pips more on a stop that it's, that it's going to cost me. So we could go down to try to get a little bit more development on this thing. Now, once I look at the hourly, this isn't going to be as bullish because now we're just looking at this real granular bump that popped us up 50 pips off those lows. There's a couple of different ways of playing something like this. Now, if we are going to operate, operate under the presumption that this is going to function as the higher low, what do we next need to see to continue that formation? We now need a higher high, right? Now, I know where my swing point is. My swing point is just right here. That was the prior swing high, which meshes really well with a batch of prior lows, right? So I have a usable, workable point here. I'll put this right on that candlestick body right there, and then let's do a parallel up there. There we go. So this gives me a little zone to work with for resistance, okay? So I'm going to turn this into a decision zone. So what I want to see now is I want to see dollar yen break to the upside above that prior point of resistance, and I'll even let this thing fly. I don't care how deep it drives. I'm not going to chase it. Let it run. Let bulls show you that they're back. We still have unfilled gap here as well. Let that run. Now, once we do get some element of resistance coming in, well, I already know a point at which I'm willing to buy support. Robbie hit the nail on the head by the retest. Exactly. It's just textbook. Is there's 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 you know <laughs> no genius thinking in this. This is just waiting for the market to show its hand and then me trying to buy it cheap after the fact. Um, but if I can get that, the allure is that now I could play the upside through the channel, and if we do finally get a break, a bullish continuation move outside of that channel, then I'm already positioned in, and I could use the position that I'm setting up here to base into a bigger position. I can add as that bullish movement continues so that if I do end up with like a, a weeks long trend, then I could essentially just use this initial piece to try to finance the rest of the operation, or at least a portion of the rest of the operation. But on the dollar strength side of the coin, this is one of the more attractive setups to me at the moment. To me, it feels as though we had an, an, an inclusion of risk aversion to open up this week and it, it largely feels like it was around the healthcare bill. Uh, I have a question here that syncs up perfectly with this from uh, my friend Hans. What causes such a gap? So the efficient market, and I'm not going to propone EMH here, but the efficient market hypothesis basically dictates that as new information gets priced in, we'll see prices change. The more new information we have or the more 
um, relevant it is, the faster we'll see those prices change. During the weekend, we do get new information, right? But markets or trading isn't open to price that in. So when we open on Sunday, we now need to price in this new information. The big change this weekend was the failure of that healthcare bill. Now, I don't think it was the healthcare bill itself that really created risk aversion. I think it was fear around Donald Trump. I think it was the fact that the Trump reflation trade had run so high for so long that it was almost accepted that we were getting fiscal stimulus, that we were going to have tax cuts, that we were going to have all kinds of great stuff happening. When the health care bill didn't get passed, it then raised questions as to whether or not those other things may end up happening. I think that was kind of the initial, <clears throat> let's say, driver of that risk aversion. Now, I have a slightly different take on matters. I think this is more of a Fed thing, right? Because if you look at you know key risk markets like the S&P 500, really things have not been the same since that rate hike. That rate hike happened right here. And notice we had that quick one-day pop, which helps us set a new high. But after that, we got a doji, sell-off, and now we're putting in bearish price action. Go down to a four-hour chart, lower lows and lower highs. Um, we could be looking at a new higher low here. I've written about that in Market Talk. Um, I do have some time dedicated to the S&P a little bit later, but I know there's a lot of folks with currency questions, so I wanted to get back to those and uh, we're on the stock route here in a moment. But the number one answer for you, Hans, is going to be the pricing in of new information after a market is closed. Equity markets have a tendency to gap a lot more often, a lot more regularly than uh, many FX markets. It's because they're closed pretty much every day, right? So like when Apple closes today, if something happens Apple-related, when Apple stock opens for trading tomorrow, it'll then get priced in, then the difference between today's close, tomorrow's open, that's going to be the gap. Okay, another side for dollar strength on the Aussie. Now, the Aussie has been working with a really interesting trend line. It gave me a little bit of penetration outside of that trend line, which I say a little bit. Notice that we just got a tweezer top right in there. A little bit of penetration out of that trend line, which gave me a, uh, you know, a reason to question continuation potential. Um, but since then, we've seen a, a breakdown lower. We're seeing current support show up at the 23.6 of the most recent major move. Pretty standard kind of stuff. Okay, now this is where things get interesting for the bearish continuation setup. Because notice right here, about 76 and a half, up to about 76 and three quarters, we have what was previously a pretty interesting zone of prior support. And we caught some element of resistance right there. Now, there's another reason that I want to reassign that level for possible resistance. And it has to do with this. And the fact that if I can get this to wiggle up a little bit deeper, yet while staying below this double bar high with the lower close right there, if I can get that resistance within this zone, then I could look at a very, well, relatively very tight stop above that prior high, that little double top up there. Let's call it a tweezer top. And to, in essence, play for the continuation trade so that I could factor a 1 to 1.5 or thereabouts down to this 38.2. Because notice where support came in on Aussie just a few weeks ago, right? A 75 flat, right? So I know the point where I want to be shuffled off of most of my exposure on bearish positions, right? About 75, just in case we get another repeat of support piping in at that big level. Big level of resistance in the past too. Right, 75 is not to be trifled with on the Aussie. So I want to set this thing up so that I could basically get, if we get down to 75, so that I'm doing so with my stop at break even, with a piece of the position already scaled out. The last thing that I want is to get down towards my profit target to realize that I'm at a really big level that may not arrive. At that point, I got I have to redraw my game plan, and I don't like that because once you get in a trade, your bias changes. Your thinking changes. You can't help it. You're now attached to this trade by confirmation bias. So I don't go into rooms that I don't know how to get out of before I get in there. And it's kind of like that with Aussie. I want to have a good idea for how I'm going to get out of this thing. And if I don't get that sharp continuation move, I don't want to mess around. I don't want to hang out in here while we're in that resistance zone 
I'm in a short position. Um, so that's what I want to look for on the strong dollar side of the Aussie. Dollar CAD. I know I've got a lot of folks in the room that love them some dollar CAD. And rightfully so. That could be a, a fun pair to work with. Now, this setup is going to look probably more bearish in nature given the fact that we're continuing to resist off the projection of this trend line that made up a very interesting bear flag formation. That's not the part of the setup that's attractive to me because notice that the bearish side of dollar cat has been pretty well bid over the past couple of months. I like the bullish side of this thing and I have a way where I could look for this to fill in. Look at that projected trend line, just running along price action. There's also a big level here at about 34. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reassign that as a decision level. If I could get price action breaking above this zone, let's call it like 33.96 up to 34.15. If I could get price action breaking above this zone, that's the point with which I want to start looking for a bullish setup. Now, you know, kind of like I was looking to do in dollar yen, I want to let this run, let this run, let this run. I don't care how high it goes. I'm not going to chase it until I can buy support which I want to look for around that 34 level. 34 has been a big level in the recent past in dollar CAD. You know, uh, not quite as important as what we've seen on uh, 75 on Aussie, but, you know, kind of the same thing. It's one of those psych levels just continue to get some price action inflections. And I got to take that into account if I'm going to be doing anything here. I'm looking for the big level. <laughs> there we go. I look at the way this was catching swing lows all the way back there. 34 is also a fib number, but I think that's just coincidental happenstance. Uh, but I want to let price action break up before I'm going to look to chase that higher. Okay, and the last market that I want to look at for today, SPOOS, the S&P 500. So we have what kind of feels like a veritable wall of worry on this thing. Um, you know, and, and we saw it last week with this gap lower and then we saw it again this week with this gap lower and you kind of see let's take away today's price action you kind of see what was actually creating that worry right it's been a while since we've seen a sequence of lower lows and lower highs build in here on the S&P it certainly since the election right and even before the election bearish moves you know seemed as though they had you know, somewhat of a somewhat of a limit to how, how, how far they had run but since we got that, that, that last rate hike, things just have not been the same. Rate hike here, lower low, lower high, lower low, and it looked like we had a lower high. Now, this was real interesting because we essentially saw this high print or come in around the Asian session. And when I wrote Market Talk this morning, I alerted you to a support zone right down here where I think the higher low could create a continued burst. There's a trend line in here, and I want to see what price action does with this trend line. At this point, I'm under the mind that we are going to get a retest, then a topside break. But I think buy the dip is still in force until we know that it isn't. And we'll know that it isn't when we get some of these downside breaks. Now, the levels that I'm looking at for such a theme go a little bit deeper. The 618, this is where it could start to get pretty interesting. But it's this level and this level that's going to open me up a little bit more to the idea for continued bearishness on the S&P. No, I know. That's a pretty big move, right? It's basically the entirety of the 2017 move. There's another reason that I'm watching these levels in particular. They sync up with and are quite confluent with the Fibonacci retracement levels of a bigger picture Fib around that post-election move, right? The, let me get the 23.6 in there. Right there. That 23.6 syncs up pretty well with the 50 fib. If we break below that, I'm not necessarily going to get too worked up. It's breaking below the 38.2, which syncs up fairly close, about 12 handles away from the 76.4. This is where things are going to look a bit dicier. And then if we break below this 22.32, which is very near 22.16 on the bigger picture fib, then that's where I'm looking at this post-election Trump trade being invalidated here on the S&P 500. Now, I know a lot of folks want to draw this back to fiscal policy or health care bills or what they're watching on TV or what's happening in Washington. To me, it's a lot more simple than that. When the Fed hiked rates, 
we've seen things change here via price action. Lower lows, lower highs in the S&P. The bigger tell is the U.S. dollar just absolutely cannot catch a bid or hasn't been until today, right? That rate hike happened right here, and it's been a steady slide ever since. It's like almost a, yeah, it's a two, two and a half percent move, give or take, in a couple of weeks. And this is when the Fed hiked rates. So I think that this kind of exposes that there is some considerable concern right now around the trajectory of fiscal policy. Now, this was something that I was talking about back at the beginning of last year. Let's go over to the S&P. Now, if we put this move in scope, let's go with a clean chart clean-ish. If we put this move in scope, what's happened the past few years, basically post-financial collapse, it just appears that much more of the outlier. All right, we're used to relatively steady markets. I mean, even in the run-up to 87, it'll get bullish, but we'll get a pullback. You know, this is an important part of evolution, of this cycle of of, of uh, waste removal, if you will. But higher highs, higher lows, nice and steady wins the race. Now, things got to uh, began to get parabolic here in the mid-90s, and this is as the Internet began to take over the world. So when AOL started sending out 15 pieces of mail to every single person every single day, right? Remember that dot-com era? Companies like Pets.com, IPO with exorbitant valuations. Well, not really valuations because they never – made a profit. But that gravy train ran so good for so long that pretty much anybody that did want to buy tech stocks had bought them with leverage up to their eyeballs. So we simply got to a point where anybody that wanted to buy had already bought. And there was nobody left on the sidelines to continue pushing prices any higher. Now that's when we started to get a slide in stocks. Now the Federal Reserve hurried and hustled and jerked rates down really quick to try to stem this decline. Right, but it, it 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 didn't work. Prices just kept going down. Now that set stocks up in a very vulnerable position. So that once 9/11 happened right here, things really hit the skids. That's when we got this terminal selling here in the S&P, and that lasted for a couple of years, well, a year and a half. But it's right around here that those really low interest rates, the Fed started jerking lower here, began to actually show some economic stimulus promise. This is when we started to see home buying really picking up. Home prices were beginning to jump. And then as home prices were jumping, more and more people wanted to go out and get loans. And then you started to see construction stocks, real estate stocks, all going up as home prices begin to lift on this newfound demand. Now that ran for a while. Now as we're, we're moving up here, the Federal Reserve finally decides they need to start adjusting interest rates to try to stem inflation, which they do. And they adjust, 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 adjust. Now, I believe it was right here. My memory is uh, a little little splotchy around this period. It's a pretty fun time. Also pretty stressful. But it was right around here. The stock started to pull back, and the Federal Reserve threw out an emergency 75 basis point rate cut. And the Dow Jones rallied. And I remember so everybody on my desk thought that the party was back and we were going to get new all-time highs. Because at that point, we were resisting on that prior tech boom swing high. Yeah, that didn't work out too well. Again, it just put stocks on the ropes in a vulnerable position so that once we started to see these really bearish factors hitting, like Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers, there was a really big reason for capitulation, and that happened really quickly. Now, from boom to bust, boom to bust, we go right into the next boom. Rates get jerked down to the floor, ZERP, basically zero interest rate policy. We get TARP. And first round of QE. Now, once that first round of QE is over, markets start to go down, and the Fed says, uh-uh, we're not going to revisit 666 on the S&P. So this is when we start to hear rumors of QE2. QE2 gets announced shortly thereafter. Then we end up with a third round of QE. Then we end up with Operation Twist. And today, interest rates are still pretty near that zero floor, right? 
the Fed was just a little bit slower in hiking rates to adjust to this cycle than what they were to this cycle or to that cycle. So last month was the first hike, or March was the first hike that wasn't well telegraphed from the Fed, as in months in advance, right? When we came into March, odds for a hike at the Fed's March meeting were about 30 to 40 percent. A week later, and this is, just to equate this on the chart, this is right here. Excuse me. 228.0400 in the afternoon, so 1600. Right there, 228, 1600. That's when Mr. John Williams of the San Francisco Fed spoke up just about four hours before Donald Trump's joint address to the union when he said that he felt that markets would be able to handle three interest rate hikes from the Fed this year. We started to see those March rate hike odds shoot up. Then Trump's joint address to the union happened after market close. But notice when we opened up for the next day, big gap higher, big jump, big continuation. We set a high at about 2 o'clock, and that is the all-time high. We have yet to get back there. Since then, we had a slow burn. We got that rate hike, which gave us a lower high. And now we're dealing with some more lower lows. Now, the reason that I don't think that this is it, as far as a bigger market correction, is because the Fed has just started this hiking cycle. They're not committed to a whole lot of hikes in the future. And there's still a lot of opportunities for them to back off. Like right now, when we have three different Fed speakers all giving commentary to markets at the same time, there's a lot of area for them to add some innuendo in here that could exude caution to markets. And I think that if we are going to be looking at any possible scenarios or probable scenarios in the near term, that would be what it is. We don't have another uh, Fed meeting with a press conference until June. So there's a lot of room here for the Fed to operate. Longer term, all this Fed speak may be adding more confusion to the equation. But for where we're at right now, where stocks are feeling like they've just taken a punch, like they might be on the ropes, I think that this is a pretty comfortable spot for the Fed to talk things back up. And I think that's what we're going to see, at least in the near term. Um, now, I have a few other setups to look at, but I see there's a lot of questions. So rather than just going over my stuff, I want to look at what you ladies and gentlemen are looking for. Uh, so let's see what we have. Uh, if we saw, hi, James, I want to look at pound yen, dollar, and uh, SPY. Um, all right, so we got the spoos. We got the dollar. We did not get pound yen. All right, I just set an analyst pick on this one. Um, just about, I think it was about an hour ago. Uh, if you want to read that, the full setup is right here. There you go, my friend. Uh, and I'll be happy to walk you through it right now. All right, to try to clean things up a bit, I'm going to go over to this chart. Let me remove some of these, uh, move some of these drawings here. All right, so the way that I see pound yen right now is that we're basically within a symmetrical wedge formation. A little dirty, a little dirty. Uh, I say a little dirty because we didn't have a lot of great support on the underside of this thing. What makes this trend line work is this recent price action. I'll show you when we get down to the hourly chart. But the fact that it syncs up so well with this prior movement just helped to add a little bit of a lure to the level for me. Um, but in essence, we have resistance encapsulated by this resistance trend line support from this support trend line. Now, going down a little bit tighter, four-hour chart, there we go. Okay, so you can see where the point of substantiation of this trend line, that's what syncs up so well with that prior iteration, and that's what makes me a little bit more interested in this area. Um, the more important tell to me is the fact that we caught a pretty strong reaction off the 50% Fib retracement. Uh, back here in, in uh, mid-January. We haven't yet seen a return of bullish price action in pound yen, but we're sitting in front of what could be a really big driver tomorrow with that Article 50 deal. And it seems to me like the yen is a bit overbought at the moment. And so this seemed like a good area to be able to set up both of those macro themes. Now for the stop, I'm going to try to get my stop below that swing, below the 50% retracement, so that I'm not going to get taken out of this thing unless I do have a better idea that the bullish uptrend from the Trump trade is no longer in order. 
the profit target side of things a bit easier given all these swing points that I have to work with around 140.61 is going to be my first I have a fib there 141.70 is a secondary got that swing right there 142.45 I wanted to take it a little bit inside of the big level at 142.50 I don't want to get caught in this slop up here 143.32 actually a really big level for some random reason uh, I believe this was the Briggs at swing low in uh, in pound yen, and then uh, last stop, I believe is 144.70. I wanted to take some out before we get that 145 big figure. I'm basically trying to line this up so that I could factor out a a bigger move um, if I do get some sterling pop tomorrow around Article 50. Which for me, the jury's still out. I mean, if it's a macro feature, I I don't necessarily know how this might drive drive some strength into sterling. The one kind of working thought that I have is that just the simple fact of having some element of clarity around Article 50 having been triggered, it might give some compelling reason for short positions to close up. You know, short positions that have remained rather persistent in the British pound since the uh, sharp repricing around Brexit. That's the sharp repricing. You know, so there's a lot of room here. So that gives me the impression there's a lot of folks that are holding longer term net short positions. If we do get, you know, maybe that fear factor that, you know, most of the terminal downside move is done now that Article 50 is triggered, we got upside exposed. If we get a little bit more of that kind of sentiment within the market, I like the idea for looking for some continued run here in the British pound. Don't necessarily like doing it against the dollar because, you know, as I showed you, dollar is really weak. Uh, cables at resistance zone. Poundian seems a little bit more of a uh, cuff way to start doing it. Uh, from Daniel Norberg, I'm short cable 126. Thinks thinks I think it goes lower before moving back up. Yeah, totally possible. I mean, um, you know, it, it put in a pretty strong move lower um, around those McCafferty comments a little bit earlier, right? And I think that the reason that we saw such an expedient move is because McCaffrey really kind of voiced what the market's been afraid of, is that the BOE is, you know, so locked in on this dovish strategy post-Brexit that, you know, that Carney really doesn't want to waffle by hiking rates and then saying, well, hey, guys, I'm sorry, but, you know, the last six months of weakness that you've seen in the British pound, that's my bad. Oh, yeah, and the inflation that you're about to feel in the next few months, yep. This guy right here, you know, because if he does that, if he hikes rates at this point, he's basically saying that all the fear that I injected into markets around Brexit, that was wrong, improper, and incorrect. I was wrong. Not only was I wrong, but I took an entire economy with me while I was doing it. So I think that the BOE is going to try to stay as sanguine on inflation as they can until they can't any longer. You know, and if you look at the MPC minutes from uh, the release uh, two weeks ago, when, or actually it was last week, excuse me, when Kristen Forbes dissented, we did hear other BOE members saying that they are open to dissenting, you know, voting for a rate hike. Um, so, I mean, I think that's the kind of discord that we'd be looking for more of for a bullish sterling strategy longer term. So yeah, I could definitely see where you're looking. I mean, you're basically, you know, calling BS on the strength of this recent move, playing the longer term range, maybe doing a little bit tighter than I would, but uh, makes sense. Very logical way of going about things. <laughs> Stephen Long Island, pound pairs could be someone yelled Brexit again. Yeah, that's one of those uh, one of those triggered words, right? Or trigger words. Um, yeah, this one was uh, Ian McCafferty. Um, you know, and I think that. A lot of the central bank commentary kind of proves vexing for markets. I remember when I was coming up as a trader, I really only had to worry about Greenspan. That's it. The one guy. You know, but it was the financial collapse that really created the motivation to get all these central bankers out there giving speeches and being transparent and, you know, giving projections and dot plot matrices. And, I mean, the thing I think that we really want to look at, and this is something that I'm not hearing anybody talk about, is – is it possible for a bull market to be successful with that backdrop? I don't know if it is, right? Because this is something that is post-financial collapse, largely, with this quote-unquote transparency from central banks, and it may be a little bit too much. You know, we, we may need a little bit more opacity between the central bank and markets to create a little bit of that um, 
less reliance situation, right? Where we're not seeing the move entirely priced in before the news actually comes out. Might be a good thing. Uh, from Robbie Hill, sure does look like a nice flag uh, upside on dollar yen. Yeah, I think that's a, I think it's a workable set. You know, I think the big, big tell there is going to be BOJ comments. I mean, it's a central bank driven market. It's kind of par for the course, right? But, uh, uh, but yeah, I think that the BOJ is going to get more and more vociferous as we see the yen continue to strengthen, continue to strengthen, continue to strengthen. I think it's just a matter of time. And one of the things that I've kind of kept in the back of my mind is that Japan is the one nation that I've heard of, at least that the current administration is singled out as not being a currency manipulator. And I think that's pretty key when it comes down to trade discussions, that they're not a currency manipulator. That's what they've said, not me. Uh, from Steve, uh, fuel from cable bullishness after Article 50 trigger, trigger could be the many traders who uh, like to be long sterling, but have been avoided GBP first until Article 50 occurs, and will also be short to give up GBP, fails to make much more progress lower on Article 50 news. Yeah, I'm in the second of those camps. I think that, if anything, we'd see a short squeeze, um, you know, essentially driven from the fact that we got a little bit more clarity on Brexit. We at least know the UK's direction on matters. And it could give a very compelling reason for some of those longer-term short positions to close up. You know, I mean, if you're short from 135 on the night of Brexit, or even the week after Brexit, and you know, we're now at 125 or thereabout, and we're about to see a game-changing piece of, of of information come in, it could be a very logical reason to close up some short exposure, in my mind. I like it, Robbie. We got the. Uh, Got the same reload methodology here on dollar yen. Looks like the S&P as well. Um, beautiful, beautiful stuff. Uh, from in here, uh, hey James, thanks for your work. Do you think triggering Article 50 tomorrow will affect all pairs or just GBP pairs? My guess, uh, I'm saying more than a guess, my educated guess is that it's going to be pretty much isolated to sterling and euro. But it's definitely possible for some macro impact to spill over into the dollar, the yen, etc. But I think that the um, you know the, the the largest result will be seen in euro and, and sterling pairs. Ah, Robbie, yeah. So euro yen and pound yen are positions that I'm building into currently and in, uh, into tomorrow's news. Yeah. So the one that I've been I don't want to say fixated on because that implies it's more than a trade, but the one that I've really been uh, you know, trying to work myself into is uh, a euro pound uh, yen spread. What I'm trying to do, so I have that long pound yen position, but I didn't like the idea of going into tomorrow with with as much yen risk as I have. I still do have some long yen exposure off my Aussie yen setup from a couple weeks ago, but uh, you know, I was trying to justify a way to pull a short position here in euro yen. I just couldn't do it. Um, you know, so that I could essentially take net effective exposure or short euro pound, you know, crossing out the yen. Uh, I just couldn't get the setup to work in my eyes. Uh, to me, this thing's looking pretty bullish. We have a shorter term little kind of bear flag type of deal after 764 trace. So that's what I was trying to use to load up. The short set, it just wasn't there for me. Let's go a little tighter. There we go. See, we've just had this trepidation of of, uh, of sellers once we get down to some of these lower levels. So this to me feels like we have some long-term support here, and this thing's getting ready to rocket. So you know, there there's there was a very valid case we made for me to try to you know split the set up and take you know half long euro yen, half long pound yen. Um, but you know, given that I'm going, you know, Sterling's going right into the open fire tomorrow, I'm gonna go ahead and you know keep it in the hot dot. But yeah, I like the idea, I like where you're looking on that one, Robbie. Uh, from Moreno, James, you know when the time of Article 50 will be triggered? So most recent information I got was 12:30 London time tomorrow. Um, 
you know, I was looking all over for that stuff, and it seemed as though, you know, every news outlet in the world could tell me what Brexit was and what it was all about, but none could tell me when it was going to actually happen. Um, but the most recent thing that I've heard is tomorrow, 1230, London time. Uh, question here, what is a short squeeze? Oh, it's a very good question. Um, so a short squeeze, let me try to get you a good example here. Okay, so if we take the Brexit move and the British pound right in here, well, what creates moves? There's only one thing, really, that creates moves. Supply and demand, right? When you see a, you know, a, a back-breaking move like this, you had a ton of supply with very little demand. So there's a bunch of folks opening short positions to offer that supply. Sure, there were probably some longs were closing up, but the net movement here was lower, so we know that there was, uh, this was a short-driven move, right? Well, if you're in a short position, what do you have to do at some point in the future? You have to buy to close, right? Now, the very simple act of you buying to close, recover your short position means you're going to need to put some demand into the markets, right? Now, if a market remains pretty bearish and there's new sellers entering from the sidelines, well, they could offset that buying demand, pretty simple, and prices could keep moving down. But once we get that uh-oh factor, like let's just say, for instance, that we got down here in October and then David Cameron calls an impromptu press conference and says, hey guys, you know what, remember that Brexit thing? Let's forget about it. It's a bad idea. Let's say that happened. Well, now the reason for this movement doesn't really make a lot of sense. But more than that, think about what some of the folks that are holding short positions are going to do. They're going to all rush for the door at the same time. they got to buy back to cover. Now, as they buy back to cover, that pushes demand, demand pushes prices higher, and prices go, go, go. Now, as that price goes higher, that squeezes currently held short positions as those profits on shorts evaporate with that deeper price movement. That's a short squeeze. Pretty interesting uh, when you could catch them. Uh, Robbie Hill. Uh, Pound yen or a pound dollar is a very nice triple bottom on the daily. Uh, that green zone mark would be hard bottom to take out. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, I think the real interesting thing on cable is the long-term setup, and I think a lot of folks kind of forget about this. You know, so a lot of folks know the story about when Soros broke the BOE, but that actually wasn't the weakest spot price in Sterling's history. That was right down here in 1984 going into 1985. There was, I believe it was only about five months where cable traded below 120. And that led to the Plaza Accord, which was a game-changing agreement that elicited some significant dollar weakness, some significant sterling strength, um, some significant yen strength, which was kind of game-changing for those folks. 1985 Plaza Accord. We were up at 260 on dollar yen. Three years later, buck 23. It's a heck of a move. Uh, but yeah, that was the Plaza Accord right there. Can you imagine the Plaza Accord in the age of Twitter? I think financial Twitter would uh, would blow a gasket and uh, begin eating itself. That might be pretty interesting. <laughs> um, but, folks, I just want to say thank you so much, everybody, for your time today. I am completely out of setups. Uh, a lot of really good questions. I will be back on Thursday at 2 p.m. Now, if you had any questions that I wasn't able to answer, please don't hesitate to let me know. I'm available on Twitter. I'm more than happy to help with whatever I might be able to. Um, one second. I'll get that for you. There we go. Yeah, just go ahead and throw me a tweet, and I'll do my best to get back with you in a, uh, in a very expedient fashion. But, uh, folks, thank you so much for your time. I hope you have a fantastic rest of the day, and as always, happy trading, ladies and gentlemen.